right. Well, good morning, everyone. I am Pastor Daniel, pastor here at the McCordsville United Methodist Church. I want to welcome you all both online and in person to worship here today. Do want to uh, uh, open up here with a word of prayer. So we're going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to go right into a time of worship. So let's bow with me and let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning just so thankful that we could gather here and just worship you. We pray our hearts are filled with your, with your presence. We pray that, God, that by your spirit that you work upon our hearts and our minds. And we just pray that, God, this time together would be transformative in all of our lives. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with us and we'll begin worshiping.
by declaring our faith together. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, just take a moment, turn around, wave at one another, welcome one another, welcome one another. Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yes, yes. I always miss this part in the first service. I can't figure out a place to do that, but I feel like we need to. We may have a seat, may have a seat, we may have a seat. Well, this morning I do uh, want to share with you a strategic concern or two. Monday, September 28th at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary, we will be meeting as the uh, Administrative Council of the Church. If you are a part of that, please make a note of that date. Put it in your calendar. Make a notification. However you need to be reminded, do so, please. Also, Sunday, September 27th is when we will be celebrating Lord's Acre. And we've been talking about different ways that we can celebrate it. But one thing that we are going to do, and this is a bit of a leap of faith, <laughs> we are going to open up the service for folks to talk about what Lord's Acre has meant to them through the years. So, you know, we'll see how it goes and, uh, and, and just see what happens out of that conversation. But it'll be very similar to kind of how we do the time of prayer requests, where we'll be able to share with one another what, you know, memories about what Lord's Acre has meant and, and just celebrate it through sharing those memories. So... That is our plan, which I do have an update for you on that Lord's Acre. I don't know if I put the slide up. I don't think I did in the right spot here, and she found it. Thank you, Christina. If you can squint, we're going to make this even bigger next week. Uh, you can see that we have raised uh, $1,975. We've actually raised over $2,200 now. Uh, so we have, uh, we're on our way to meeting our goal to reseed Lord's Acre to ensure that in 2021 we'll be able to have our festival and, and do all those things that we enjoy and love and we'll have hush puppies and deep fried Oreos. Yes! So thank you for your generosity on that and that is coming in and, and again just thank you so much for that. I don't think there is any other strategic concern that I am missing. Looking around the room, I think that is it. Oh, I do want to share one thing. Yes, yes. Food pantry, another update. I know that's been a big part of our church in the, this last uh, six months. Uh, it helped hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of families uh, um, uh, with food. And Donna, she gave an update this morning about it and just thanked everybody for helping. Mike Edson, he, uh, he helped big time uh, yesterday and uh, getting the food and bringing that food here. Um, but, uh, but there was a, a drive uh, with a, through the Rotary Club, so we have a whole bunch of food to be able to give out. And again, we want to thank everyone that makes that possible, whether you're giving financially towards it, whether you're one of the people that come in and help during the week. You know who you are, Kim Manka, yes, and, and Judy and, and different folks. But there's a whole slew of folks that makes that happen. It's not just Donna. Um, it, I mean, there's a whole team of people that work in the background to make it happen. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for that. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Corey. All right. Will you stand with us once again, and we'll continue our worship this morning.
where sin runs deep, your grace is born, where grace is found, that is where you
be seated. The powerful song and man, love the imagery of the last one there. It's like uh, it's this side of God that it's just like this this relentless love where it's you know stop at nothing, stop at nothing to shower us with that love. And thank you guys for sharing that. Thank you for leading in that. Well, this morning, is there any joys, some good news that we'd like to share with one another? Is a part of our, our service where we like to have a bit of conversation and just kind of find out how folks are, what's going on in our lives. Any joys? Any joys? Yes. Yes, it is good to have you today, Pat. Yes, yes. Sharon just shared just so thankful that Pat is with us, a friend of hers. Yes, yes. Anything else? It was so good to this morning. We also had a real treat, uh, Marilyn Hart. And uh, how long has Marilyn, Bob and Marilyn, been a part of this church? I mean, it has been uh, decades, decades and decades. And uh, this morning we began our first service with a duet between Saran and, and Marilyn, and that was just such a joy, such a joy. Any other joys? Anything else? Any prayer concerns we'd like to share? Anything at all? Something we'd like to lift to God? Yes, they're in the back. Okay. Definitely prayers for, for him. Yes. Yes. It's amazing when we start a day with something like that, some biblical truth or a song that's on our heart, and uh, just like wow, wow, yes. But uh, also share uh, prayers for for David and. The, uh, and he uh, had a, uh, a knee replacement, and they found that blood clot. So definitely prayers for him. Definitely, yes, Carter. 
my four-year-old lifted his hand, and apparently he had something to say, but he can't, I think he changed his mind. <laughs> okay, any other prayer concerns? Yes, any others? We do want to remember um, the Arbuckle family, the Harrison family, um, and the Bevington family. Uh, all these families have experienced loss in, in the last uh, so many weeks, and uh, a uh, loved one had passed, and so uh, definitely prayers to them. Uh, the Bevington family has been hit very hard over the last six to eight weeks. Uh, the, the sons, they uh, have had a service for their mom six to eight weeks ago, and then tomorrow they're going to have services for, for their dad. And so uh, it's been a, been a heavy, heavy summer for them. So please, please make note and uh, lift them in prayer, please. All right, yes. The Ray Holmes family? Helms family. Definitely prayers for the Helms family as well. Definitely. All right. Well, let's turn to our God in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning recognizing your word to be true. Your word tells us that you, Jesus, are the same yesterday and forever. That you are the unchanging one. And so the stories we read about in the Gospels, we know that's still who you are. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be with these families. These families that are experiencing a time of grief trying together to find what it means for them to live out their new normal. And we just ask God for grace to be poured, poured into their hearts, into their minds, into their lives, that they may find that new normal. Father, for those people in our community that are wrestling, struggling with uh, mental illness, depression, and, and any, any, any form of mental illness, God, and we just pray, God, that you would be with them in this time. We pray that you would pour grace. We pray that conversations would happen. We pray, God, that they would find the courage that is needed to reach out for help. Father, this morning we pray for those people that aren't in a relationship with you, just struggling in life and not in a relationship with you. And we pray, God, that you, by your Holy Spirit, would lead us to them to share with them Christ. That we, through the way we treat them, the way we have conversation, what we, what we do, God, that, that they would just be pointed to your Son, through us. Father, this morning we continue to pray for all of those that are on the front lines of this pandemic. And we just ask God that you would protect those health officials. Build a hedge of protection around them. Keep them safe. Keep them in your arms. And now I invite you to pray with me the prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to be continuing our sermon series around the Psalms. I'm very excited about this. This, uh, uh, this uh, psalm, you know, sometimes in these sermon series, I try to think of like, you know, creative titles, you know, to give to them. The title of today's message is simply Psalm 5. <laughs> so that's what we're going to be eventually looking at is Psalm 5. And we will be sticking around the Psalms for a while. Um, so that's kind of where we're going to be, and that's the direction that we're heading. But have you ever found yourself in what we call a pickle before. Anyone ever found themselves in a pickle before? You know, a difficult situation where you're just unsure what it is that you should do. Weighing your options just didn't seem to gain you any ground for each answer to your pickle didn't seem to fix your problem. The problem just continued to remain. And classic imagery of being in a pickle is when a baseball player is caught between a couple of basemen. This is a blast from the past here. Stan Musial in the 1946 World Series against the Yankees. But if he was to go to the first, he's out. Go to second, he's out. Pickles. We've all been in them. Makes me think of a time that me and my brother were in a pickle. Oh. Well, this time, we accidentally, and it was totally his fault. Let me just lead with that. This was totally my brother's fault. The time that my brother and I knocked down the front door of the parsonage at Lagodi. Uh, you know, we're both, you know, growing up in a, in a preacher's home, we're PKs, and definitely my dad would call us creative children. And this was one of those creative moments. Now, some of you have heard this, but Andy was watching some of his football with a friend. Back then, my brother was hardcore into the Chicago Bears. 
Well, the movies that we had uh, in the house there were on the far wall of the living room. And the only way to get to these movies was to walk in front of the television that, yes, my brother was passionately watching the Chicago Bears probably get beat. <clears throat> no offense to any Bears fans. I do like watching them. <sighs> well, that day I was a bit indecisive. And I couldn't decide what movie I wanted to watch. So I went to the shelf, looked, made a choice. Started watching, wasn't into it. So I went back, looked again, tried another, wasn't feeling it. So I went back and I checked again, ensuring that every time I walked in front of the TV, I just went a little bit slower. Because that's just what little brothers do, right? Well, by this time, my brother warns me. He says, Daniel, if you walk in front of my TV one more time, I'm going to kick this door in your face. Kick the living room door in my face. I didn't believe him. I thought he was full of this. Like, there's no way he'd actually kick a door into my face, right? Well, so I did what little brothers do. I went back to check for this movies, these movies one last time. And as soon as I stepped through the threshold, as soon as I stepped into that living room, he kicked the door right into my face. I then rolled backwards down the hallway. At which point, for reasons completely unknown to me, I ran outside screaming my head off. Just ran outside yelling at the top of my lungs. Now again, it was football season, later in the football season, so it was rather cold outside. And all I had on was shorts and a t-shirt. Andy, as soon as I left the building, left the house, he locked me out. I told Andy, I said, let me in, I'm freezing. He said no. And then through some sobs and tears, I told him that if he didn't let me in, I was going to kick the front door down. He said no. So I kicked once. The door shuttered. I kicked twice. The door and frame shuttered. And I kicked a third time. There was no more shuttering. The whole door and frame fell into the house. Boom. I still remember when I walked in on top of the door, Andy was staring like, oh my dear Lord. <laughs> Andy and I that day, we found ourselves in a pretty serious pickle. Would you agree? <laughs> it's a pickle of all pickles. Did we just own up to what we had done? You know, right? Parents always say, if you would have just told us, you wouldn't be in so much trouble. Uh, no. <laughs> or do we try to fix the door? That way mom and dad won't ever know about our little spat. Only problem there, we weren't carpenters. <laughs> so we knew we'd not be able to properly fix the door. Guess what we did? We attempted to fix the door. I went into the garage and I found some wood glue. And I glued the entire frame back together, piece by piece, splinter by splinter. It actually looked... Structurally, it looked perfectly normal. So we locked the door, walked away. Two days later, Dad tried to open the front door. That door is never locked. Like, you know, we go to Indiana, small rural town. That door was never locked. He comes around the garage, unlocks the door, turns that handle, and pulls it in. And when he pulled it in, that door fell onto him. All I will say is we did not come out of that pickle unscathed. <laughs> did we get into some serious, probably the most serious trouble that I could ever remember? Why I tell that story? One thing that I love about the Psalms is that many of them were born while they, the Psalm writers, were in pickles of their own. And I love the sheer honesty and just the bluntness that the psalm writers put into the psalms. It's like God intended for humanity to shine through where we could relate to what was going on in their lives. And if they're in a pickle, oh, you can tell through their intentional choice of words. Through the wording, you can feel the frustrations, you can feel the anger, you can even feel the stress that they may have been going through and what they're sharing about. And for me, it just makes the Psalms that much more real and that much more just alive in God. It's like, wow, these are awesome. Psalm 5, our psalm today, is one such psalm. I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. This is an intense one. <laughs> Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. 
Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord adhere, abhors the bloodthirsty and the deceitful man. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an empty grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance of their transgressions. Cast them out. For they, they have rebelled against you. Whew. And to think that was a song. <laughs> Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we ask in Christ's name right now that you would just continue to work within our hearts and our lives. By your Holy Spirit, take this time to shape, mold, and form us. And all God's people said, Amen. Maybe seated, maybe seated, have a seat. So, what is, what is going on here with this psalm? <laughs> this is another psalm that we can trace down a bit of the backstory. You know, find out what was going on in the psalm writer's life when it was written. This particular psalm was, again, written by none other than King David. And if you are in church last week or you tuned in last week, then you already know the backstory of what was going on in David's life when God took his experience and through the Holy Spirit inspired Psalm 5's writing. It is thought that David wrote this psalm when he heard some murmuring about what his son Absalom was up to to in Jerusalem and the rest of Israel. Namely, his little political underground campaign to usurp and murder him. Absalom, as the scriptures so reveal, effectively through his silver tongue and charming demeanor and really even his presence, the scripture says that there was not a single blemish from Absalom's head to his foot. So through all of that, he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. From his father, David. Which then led to him rounding up an army that was two-thirds larger than the army that David had. As we discussed last week, when the armies faced off, it did not, did not end well for Absalom. Joab, the same Joab that sought to bring Absalom back to Jerusalem after a spat with his father David, well... Obviously, he learned of the deceit and the deception that Absalom had blinded the people of God's kingdom with, and he was livid. He was not happy about it at all. And when given the opportunity, he was the one that, in fact, slain him. Check this out. This is an interesting passage. <laughs> and Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. And his head caught fast in the oak, and he was suspended between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under him went on. I'm like, you know, I just, I, when I read that the first, I laughed. I was just like, like this guy was able to do what he did in Israel, and to like get this army rounded up, and then he gets his hair caught in a tree? And I was just like, wow, that's kind of ironic. It's like, Ew. And it goes on, it goes on. And a certain man saw it and told Joab, I love this, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. Joab said to the man who told him, What? You saw him? Why then did you not strike him to the ground? And then after Joab listened to the man's excuses for not killing Absalom himself, Joab said, and I love his response, he says, I will not waste time like this with you. It's like, come on, man. I ain't going to waste time listening to this. And he took three javelins in his hand and thrust them into the heart of Absalom while he was still alive in the oak. Whew. That's intense. That's where the path that Absalom went down, that's where it led him. But let's rewind back to the context of Psalm 5. When David was wrestling with what to do about his son. Imagine what it was like for David to be in the pickle that he was in. I mean, he, his very own son, his boy, 
was attempting to overthrow the throne. His method to do so was pretty stinking effective. I mean, prey on people that injustice is done to them and make promises that he in no way could have kept. This comes from 2 Samuel. You can check it out. And then Absalom went after the people that were unhappy with his father's expansion of the kingdom. <sighs> Psalm 5. We find David referencing all of that when he said this. There's no truth in their mouth. Talking of the deception. Their inmost self is destruction. Talking about what's happening within Israel. The throat is an open grave. Again, the words flatter with their tongue. And then he shifts. Let's make them bear their guilt, God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance of their transgressions. Cast them out, for they they've rebelled against you. As a father, he could hear the angst, the pain, the frustration, the inner turmoil going on in David here. As his son, of spreading lies and deception amongst the people of Israel. As his son that was trying to usurp him, and in so doing, committing in David's life, in his eyes, a grave sin against God. What options, if any, did he have? He definitely was in a pickle. In our Western mindsets, though, we may not jump to Absalom's behavior towards the throne being some kind of grave sin against God. I mean, the lying and the deception, that's like classic Ten Commandments. That's straightforward. We know. Said God said, don't do it. But, but why would him coming against the throne be so wrong? So wrong that David called his actions a direct rebellion, defiance even, unto God. Kings often throughout history were overthrown, right? Well, what does that have to do with God? We think about people being in power through our own worldviews, through how we think, through how our, our lives works. You know, folks are voted in, right? Kings are born through royal families, right? Well, in David's eyes, at this point in Israel, kings for Israel were simply chosen, cherry-picked by God. This is 1 Samuel 16.1. The Lord, God, said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? Remember Saul a few weeks back, King Saul? He says, I have rejected him for being king over Israel. It says, fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king amongst his sons. Well, that king that God cherry-picked, hand-picked, among the sons of Jesse was David. No such thing happened concerning Absalom. So he not only was he stirring a ruckus amongst the people of Israel... He was rebelling, defiantly rebelling against God. As king, David was not supposed to let these sorts of things happen. He, as king, was chosen by God to protect the throne. But the one that was doing this was his boy, was his son. So what was David's response? Psalm 5. He, instead of Rashly taking matters into his own hands, he turned the whole situation over to God in prayer. Instead of snuffing out the life of his son, stopping the division, stopping the rebellion, he put it into God's hands. And then he did the absolute unthinkable, something that we would probably consider irresponsible. He then waited. He just waited. Yesterday we were at this fantastic ice cream shop in Upland, Indiana. It's called Ivanhoe's. It's worth the hour drive. Trust me. Trust me on this. But while there, while there, I saw this bracelet someone had on. And there were just two words on this bracelet. And it, 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 just, it, was, like, it was just like a slap up against my face when I read those two words. It just said, be still. I was like, wow. And it made me think about David here. And that's what he did. He gave it to God, took his hands off of it, and was just still. I mean, remember how the psalm began? Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. 
This isn't like a, you know, 10 second prayer over a meal thing, right? This is like, this is deep down groaning. Like, like even the, the, the wording here is, is even like a, these, these gruntings, these, these, these inaudible, like not even words, just this, oh, this anguish, just anguish. Get, consider my anguish. Give attention to the sound of my cry. I love this. And my king and my God, for to you do I pray. And then this, notice this last bit. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. It's like what you're talking about, Paul. It says, in the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you. And then what? He doesn't do anything else. He just stops. And he watches. This psalm, very much so, is a prayer. And a cry from the depths of David's broken heart unto God. Asking God to deal with what all was transpiring within Israel. And here's where it gets really interesting. Verse 10 gives us a little insight into how David hoped God would deal with this situation. He prayed simply that God let them fall by their own counsels. Hmm. And this is a very interesting biblical theme that David scratched at here. When we think, and this isn't a popular topic, but it's a true topic, when we think about judgment from God, we typically have in our minds, you know, more of a courtroom sort of a setting where one's wrongs or sins are presented to God and then a judgment is issued. Or may even consider, you know, what had happened amongst the Israelites when they were in the, you know, during the Exodus and wandering around in the wilderness. That's not always how God judges. Notice this. Sometimes his judgment is literally to give people what they want. Turn them over to their own ways, to their own vices. No direct action by God needed. Their own ways, the own path they're going down will bring about their ruin. This is a little thing that eh, our culture has kind of walked away from. That's a little thing called consequences. Consequences. Love how the author of Treasure Island, Robert Stevenson, put consequences when he said this. This is great. Sooner or later, everyone sits down to a banquet of consequences. Wow, my brother and I proved that to be true. <laughs> Gee. But this is also classic Romans chapter 1. There, Paul writes, this is chapter 1, verse 28. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, God abandoned them to their foolish thinking, and he let them do things that should never be done. It's like God did what David did. Step back and wait. C.S. Lewis puts this geniusly when he said this he said there's two kinds of people that those that say to god thy will be done and those to whom god says in the end thy will be done absalom knew his father was appointed by god to be king of israel knew it he in his hurt and his pain i would even say in his arrogance and his pride he didn't care he sought the throne because he, he was the better king. He, as the other scripture in 2 Samuel says, he considered himself the better judge, the better arm of justice for the people. And this sort of intentional rebelling against God, let me just say, always ends badly. David had a different mindset about it. Verse 2 of this psalm, he even called God what? He says, my God and my king. He being a person in power. He being the most influential person in Israel. He being the king of the nation that was the apple of God's eyes. Bowed his knee in humility to God. And the first time I read that, it just, again, it just slapped me upside the face. I was like, wow. Here you have David the king turning to God and saying, you are my king. I mean, that is such a powerful statement of humility. It's like, wow. 
Absalom was allowed to run the course of his plan, as anti-God as it was. And we see what happened. David, well, he regained power and the respect of the people and then was able to live out his reign and to live out his life. So now comes the big question. So what? So what on earth can we glean from all of that for our lives today? You know, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for us? First, and this is a lesson from good old Absalom, remember that words are powerful. Spoken, written, posted on social media, words are incredibly powerful. They can be used to build someone up, to encourage them and to build them up and to speak life into them. Or they could be used to tear people down to a puddle of mess, inflict destruction, death into them. Words that can be used to garner peace, bring people together, bring communities together, or inflict division into the hearts of people. Absalom made the choice to use his words selfishly and through them wreaked havoc within Israel some time before everything came back together. But all of this is classic Proverbs 18.21. The tongue has the power of life and death. And we as people must choose wisely the words we allow to escape from our mouths. For the tongue has no bones, but sure, it can definitely break a heart. So when you are about to speak, about to share something, ask yourself, what's your intent? Are you speaking it out of offense? Then don't share. Just stop right there. Allow healing to happen within your heart and then go forth. Is your intent to do good? To build people up? Or is your intent to cause harm? To smear something? And lastly, will your words, are you ready for the consequences that those words could bring? Because once you put them out there, you can't take them back. You just can't. Yeah, I love the explanation of this of the tube of toothpaste, right? It's like words. You squeeze a tube of toothpaste, you ain't going to get that toothpaste back in the tube, right? Words are the same. And they have consequences could benefit people, or it could bring harm and pain to us and others. Secondly, secondly, recognize, like David, recognize God as the ultimate king. You know, Israel initially, they thought rather well of their kings, you know. They were all excited, and they were celebrating that, you know, we're finally given a king, and a king's going to lead us justly, and the king's going to do good to us. Yeah, they had some good ones. <laughs> and then they had some really, 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 really bad ones. And so over time, the Israelites' tune and tone about kings and all that, it really changed. <laughs> like what we find in this psalm, much later in the Psalter, and much later in the book of Psalms, says, don't put your trust in princes. <laughs> Just leads with that, you know. The kings, princes, this idea of, says, don't put your trust in a son of man in whom there's no salvation. His breath departs, he returns to the earth, and on that day his plans perish. The kings had failed Israel miserably, and from that failure their hope ultimately went back to God, and not to the one that was sitting upon the throne. I mentioned this a few weeks back, and it's come back around in this psalm again. As Christians... I believe 100% and then some that we should all take part in our democracy and vote. But our ultimate hope, it cannot be, cannot be in who's in the Oval Office or not. Our ultimate hope must be rooted and grounded in God. Lastly, and this one, this one's intense. I kind of, I really like this last, like, this bit, the teaching that this comes out of this psalm. It, it, it excites me. Lastly, don't view God as a president, but again, as a king. 
Now, what do I mean by that? In our democracy, if we don't like policies being implemented, ideas being shared, or the direction our country is going, we have the power to vote. Vote out or vote in elected officials. This is not so with God. God has set in his word what is true and what is not. We don't get to change God's mind about things. Because, well, he's God, and we're not. Absalom, perfect example, disagreed with God on who should have been king. And that did not end well at all. We, like David, should bow our knee to the one true Lord of lords and kings and kings daily, sometimes hourly, Jesus. Submit. Willingly submit to his authority and know that in so doing, we are aligning our wills with God's will for us. And this isn't like submitting to these corrupted kings. Because our God is good. Christ is good through and through. When we do so, we are then saying, as C.S. Lewis said, we are then saying to God, thy will be done. And not asking God to twist His word into somehow some way to say to us, Thy will be done. Corey's first song this morning was perfect, lay, I Lay Me Down. I had to, All throughout that song is this concept of us submitting our will to God and His will being the one and only perfect will. But another word on that. We as people, we all have wills. Would you agree? <laughs> I mean, we do. <laughs> and I'm not talking about paper kind, you know, your will for your family, but more of the there's a will, there's a way, you know. I'll say this, it is a beautiful and breathtaking thing when our wills are aligned with God's. It opens up so many doors of blessings and, and opportunity for us when we're just living our lives in tune with what He wants. But if our wills are going in the opposite direction of God, God's will, well, one day, this is a guarantee, one day, our wills will collide. And as strong as our wills may be, God-given, strong wills that we may have, it doesn't compare to how strong, how mighty, how powerful God's will. So instead of colliding with God's will one day, our aim should be to jump into the stream of His will for our lives. For then His will, by His Spirit, will empower us to live out the call that He has specifically upon us. When we're living our lives, God's will for us, well then life has a way of clicking. We find life stops being that uphill battle. And instead of doors being shut in our face, back to where we started, instead of doors being kicked in our face, we find doors being opened to us by His grace. So in closing, so in summary, the next time you find yourself in a pickle, do as, ba as David did and bow that knee to God and turn the situation over to Him and be ever so brave to then simply wait. Be ever so brave to take God at His word and just be still. Wait on God to unfold His plan. And in so doing, you're allowing the time needed for you and God's wills to align that you may then act in accordance to His will for your life. And in so doing, you will not be heading down a path like my brother and I did where you're going to be sitting at a banquet of consequences. Amen? Amen. Corey? Will you stand with us one last time?
Father, we ask that we would be a people that are aligned with your will. And we pray, God, that as we're living out our cause, that we, through the way we're living, that we would be pointing others consistently to your Son, Jesus. And we pray this all in his name. Amen. See you all next time. Be safe. Look out for one another. Look out for one another. And be a blessing. And grow with God. Amen. Amen.